Many people might ask uh, or wonder, um, what do zebras have to do with uh, solving many of the problems and the catastrophes that we're talking about on this podcast? And I think one of the super exciting things about what you all are working on is, you know, it, it's going deeper into the stack of the problem, which is uh, the ownership and economic models that sort of set up a perverse uh, race in the first place, a perverse game. You know, we often talk about with Twitter, is the problem free speech or censorship? Well, no, it's we got to change the game of what Twitter is even doing to society. And you're sort of saying we have to change the game of the economy. And we have to have a vision of an economy that really works for people. And so I would love to just, you know, set the table a little bit for listeners about what is Zebras Unite? Can you tell the origin story? Uh, and then we can uh, talk a little about the difference between zebras and unicorns. Sure, I can take that. That's happy, really very happy to be here. Um, so Zebras Unite was founded with four women founders. All of us um, were building our own products and we were told that we had to incorporate as a Delaware C Corp, we had to create a company and then we had to play the Silicon Valley game. And as we started to do this back in 2017, what we were noticing is that the structure really incentivized certain outcomes, as we all know about scale and user acquisition, growth at all costs, and making sure that you create as many profits as possible for investors. And so what we realized and what we published in our manifesto, Zebras Fix What Unicorns Break, is that the business model is the message. So we believe that the foundational piece to address and interrogate is the business model of these companies. So we proposed an alternative called the zebra, or uh, internationally it's the zebra, <laughs> which we'll try to do today. Um, and really the features of a zebra are that it is more about mutualism, shared prosperity. What we were seeing was many of these founders were interested in quality over quantity, and they were really interested in multi-state stakeholder solutions. So how might their companies not just serve to make investors very wealthy, but to also benefit the user base that and the community that has created value. Um, so we set that up in opposition to the Silicon Valley unicorn. Actually, maybe it's good just to explain what is a Silicon Valley unicorn. Not everyone might be familiar with that term. Uh, those of us here in Silicon Valley know that term very well. But just you, you want to say what in contrast, what is a unicorn that is typically desired in Silicon Valley? Yeah, so companies that um, Center for Human Technology oftentimes refers to and speak about are Silicon Valley unicorns. These are tech companies that are valued at more than a billion dollars. And by and large, they're taking what's called venture capital, which is very high risk capital, in order to provide completely outsized returns. If you were to invest a dollar, what you're looking for is a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or a million dollars. And so in effect, the type of scale that um, Tristan and the social dilemma and CHT has spoken about so um, beautifully is really that's a mechanism of a Silicon Valley unicorn company. In order to have that type of company, you need to reach that type of scale. And so Silicon Valley unicorn companies are valued at over a billion dollars. They're laser focused on user acquisition. They tend to have pretty dubious revenue models like advertising because those users are not going to be paying for the services by and large. And so you end up creating a whole system of perverse incentives that we're seeing play out over and over again. Um, so that's kind of what a, a unicorn is. And there's a massive amount of capital in the market that's available for these types of unicorn companies. And what we are advocating for is that we need many different other types of capital experiments to incentivize other types of behavior. One of the things I, I love about the work of Zebras Unite is you're going deeper into the actual worldview, the, the kind of paradigm, the mental paradigm that generates the assumptions behind the way that startups are thought about and conceived. And if I use that word conceived, you have this really fantastic essay called Sex and Startups that's kind of at the root of the philosophy of Zebras Unite. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, some of that worldview and what you're criticizing? Yes, yeah, Sassy, I don't know. Do you want to speak to that? I'd be really curious to get I your actually, take. <laughs> sure. So, um, I, so I'm new to the Silicon Valley world in this. And actually, Sex and Startups was an article that came out when I, or I crossed my path when I was working in Silicon Valley. I kind of did a two-year stint in, uh, let's say, um, undercover anthropological research uh, for this business model, because I'm actually a kind of a cooperative native. I come from a very different economic and social worldview and and then lived in the models that are being built and conceived in that worldview. So I was like, wait a second, let me go learn about this. And so I read the article Sex and Startups, and then very quickly after that read uh, Zebras Fits What Unicorns Break. And what I really took from that 
article besides the very palpable lived experience and frustration born of that experience of the four founders and clearly uh, many, many people who were sparked and called to that was to just they were really calling out um, the the kind of undercover, as you put, Tristan, the kind of assumptions embedded in the current model. And patriarchy is a very strong assumption, like so many of our hegemonic systems, right? So racism, sexism, there, you know, all the you know, classism, all the different ways that our, our world is stratified, and in particular, the United States uh, economic model is, is stratified, which, for better or worse, is the version of, you know, entrepreneurialism that seems to currently be exported around the world in so many ways. You know, you see so many people saying, we are the Silicon Valley of X, Y, or Z location. Um, and so that model is really being exported, and there are some deeply problematic embedded assumptions in it. And sex and startups really called in, like, wait a second, y'all, hold on. Like, let's examine from a different lens, because it can be incredibly valuable when attempting to do problem solving, to layer different mythic or mythological frameworks onto what the problem is or what the solution might be. And so really, when you layer on the patriarchy one, you're like, oh, wow, look at this. This this matches a bunch of things. And perhaps we could do without that. And so that article really, for me, crystallized that this was a group of humans to watch because they were very uh, fertile in like digging into what are some of the actual problems that are underneath the surface problems here? And that, to me, that's that's where you want to go when you want to make big change. You want to go under, because then if you can tweak the environment, things will naturally shift, as well as you pushing them in the right direction, which is so much more efficient uh, than trying to push a giant boulder uphill. 